Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the word chapter and verse, like we've said many times. Um, we just finished the book of Joshua, and so we are now, uh, as promised, as I finish each book, we'll do uh, a part of Isaiah. Um, Isaiah, again, very important book, but if you were to just read it, uh, if we were to just go through it chapter by chapter, it would get difficult because it seems like a lot of doom and gloom. Uh, but what God is doing is, he, he, he was, the reason that Isaiah wrote these things is because he's repeatedly warning the people, warning the people, stop doing what you're doing, stop being wicked, turn back to God, come back to God, come back to God. Because the in result of them not coming back to God is judgment. And so uh, here in Isaiah 3, he's talking about, not Isaiah 3, excuse me, Isaiah 4. In Isaiah 4, he's talking about um, the day of judgment, but he's not talking about the day of judgment the way we see it, where the day of judgment that is yet to come. He's talking about the day of judgment that fell on Israel uh, when they were carried away to Babylon. And actually, uh, we'll get into that. You know, you'll see the split from the kingdom becomes two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And this specifically is the judgment that falls upon the southern kingdom because the northern kingdom had already been carried away because they, they, never, they never would serve God. Uh, but the southern kingdom did sometimes. And so, but they were back and forth so much and every time they would go back to doing wrong, they would do it in greater measure. And so they would, then they would repent and they would stay with the Lord a little while and they would be, and then they would go back and sin again and they would do worse than they had before. And so it came to a point where they just wouldn't turn back and so God's like, okay, well, I'm going to remove you from the land. That's what he told them he would do. And we just, we just finished Joshua. Joshua told him, if you, if, you, if you serve other gods, then God's going to remove you from this land. Actually, God gave them a lot of time to repent. Um, you know, uh, he was very kind to them. Over and over again, they would turn from him. And then when they needed help, they would cry out. He would help them. And they would turn from him again after he had helped them. And so, um, actually, at the end of Isaiah chapter 3... It talks about how, like, in that day, on that day of judgment, um, the men of the city will be destroyed, you know, and so it, it focuses on how the warriors will, will, will die. And so the land then is left without a lot of men. And so that's where you have the starting of Isaiah chapter 4. And I'll go ahead and read it. It says, In that day so few men will be left that seven women will fight for each man, saying, Let us all marry you. We will provide our own food and clothing, only let us... Take your name so we won't be mocked as old maids. But in that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of all who survive in Israel. All who remain in Zion will be a holy people. Those who survive the destruction of Jerusalem and are recorded among the living. And so at first glance, that seems like a, a contradiction because it's like, well, but the land was is in desolate, they, the, the desolation. They just lost all the warriors. And, but at the same time, they're going to have this prosperity that God's talking about. Well, first of all, there's the matter of dual fulfillment. We talked about where God will make one statement in Scripture, but it's really talking about two things at the same time, two different events in history at the same time. And so what, what he's talking about here is, first of all, the, the, there's so few men left that seven women take hold of one man and say, well, let us take your name so that we won't be disgraced. And so what that, but there's no, there's no sign of repentance there. There, there's no, uh, so what, what that means is that that's like the, peop, the, the, the portion of the people in the land who are not seeking God and they're trying to fix the desolation through natural means. Okay, well, we'll just do it this way so that at least we won't be disgraced. But the ones who turn to God, those are the remnant that, are, are seeking God and those are the ones he's going to prosper because they're, they've repented, they're coming back to God. And that's talking about in that time. But then the dual fulfillment side of it is the branch is prophesied over and over again. That's a messianic prophecy about Jesus. Jesus is called the branch. Jesus is called the root of Jesse. He is called the branch. He is called the vine. And there are times when uh, he uses... Uh, branches and vines interchangeably to describe us, the people who have accepted him. And now he never calls us the root. He's the root. Um, and you say, well, how is that possible? Why would Jesus, if he's called the vine, if he's called the branch, why would he also call us vines and branches? Well, it's the same way as he said, I'm the light of the world. But then he turned around and told all of us, you are the light of the world. 
Um, so what he's doing is he, because we have a mutual faith in Jesus, uh, with Jesus because he has grafted us in, he is, set, he is giving some of the same titles that he shares to us, not all of them. He never calls us the root. He's the root. But at the same time, he's also the branch. He's also the vine. But then, like he said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Um, but then also we are also called vines in the scripture, but we are not called roots. He is the root. He is the, he is the starting point. He is, um, the point from which, uh, life is possible for others. Um, now, uh, so it says here, but in that day, I'll just read it again. Verse two, but in that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of all who survive in Israel. All who remain in Zion will be a holy people. See, he's talking about the remnant. The remnant. Uh, those, those who survived the destruction of Jerusalem and are recorded among the living. Uh, in the Old... Uh, I mean, we're in the Old Testament now, but back when uh, in, in Exodus, if you remember, the people had angered God, and God's like, I'm going to destroy them, and Moses says, no, don't destroy them. He's like, if so, then go ahead and destroy me too and erase my name from your book. So at that point, even Moses understood that God has a record of who belongs to him. He said, just you know, take, erase my name from your book. God said, no, I'll only re erase from my book the, the ones who turn away from me. Um, and then over in the New Testament, uh, the, the, seven, the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out and they performed miracles, they came back and they said, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, that's true. And he said, he said a couple other important things that eventually we'll read. But, but after that, he told them, but don't rejoice in this, that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice rather that your name is registered in heaven. And so we're talking about God's record of those who belong to him. Well, how do you get in that book? You accept Jesus as your Lord. That, then your name is in that book. Um, verse 4, the Lord will wash the filth from beautiful Zion and cleanse Jerusalem of its blood stains with the hot breath of fiery judgment. Then the Lord will provide shade for Mount Zion and all who assemble there. He will provide a canopy of cloud during the day and smoke and flaming fire at night, covering the glorious land. It will be a shelter from daytime heat and a hiding place from storms and rain. And I uh, say, well, what does that mean? Well, you remember, it, it, that's a reference to the, to the cloud of, uh, the, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire that, that uh, led the people all those years in the wilderness. But then also that those, are, those stand as symbol of, of God's Spirit among us, the Holy Spirit dwelling among us. Uh, you know, <clears throat> how do we know that? Well, because the Bible says that uh, in the New Testament that Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, and so what is that? That's the, the glory cloud, as lots of people like to call it. You know, we don't always see it. In fact, most of the time we don't see it. The point of it is it's not people get caught up on the glory cloud, the glory cloud, the glory cloud. The only reason the glory cloud is around us is because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. He's the one who brings that. The Bible says that when they dedicated the temple, the whole place was filled with smoke, a cloud of smoke, so thick that the priests couldn't even stand to minister. And we say, wow, that must have been so awesome to experience. Well, the Bible says in the New Testament that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so that, that cloud is with you everywhere you go. You just don't see it. And you don't have to see it. Um, but that's that. That's what he's talking about here. In that day, the 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 smoke and flaming fire at night. That's 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 with you. That's with you wherever you go. It's, it's the glory cloud. Because uh, it goes with you wherever you go. Because you are a mobile temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, I mean, the way God does things is just awesome. Chapter five. Now I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard. On a rich and fertile hill, he plowed the land, cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. See, there were called vines. How do we know? How do we know he's talking about the vine what vineyard he's talking about? He's talking about us. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about us. But why? Uh, why? Why does God use this language? He's used this language over and over again. You can go back and read in Psalm 80. It talks about how God transplanted a vine from Egypt. That's it, that's Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says that God called his son out of Egypt. And this is his vineyard. This is the planting of the Lord, his people. And so um, I had felt that when I would speak that out, make those references, that some, someone who's watching will probably will be saying in their heart, wow, how does he know all these things? How does he, 
How does he know this? It's because of a familiarity with God's word. It's not because I'm special. It's because I've spent time in here, and that's the purpose of us doing this. But you don't become familiar with it just by reading through it once. You have to, you, you become familiar with it by allowing the word to be stored up in your heart as you read it. Um, and so that doesn't mean, oh, well, I read five chapters today. And if, if you didn't retain any, any of that, then it's not going to do you any good. If all you can retain is one or two or three verses and you can treasure those up in your heart, that's far more valuable to God than just, well, I read a bunch of chapters today. No, if you can, and, and however much you can store that and, and keep, that is what's important. And you do that little by little over time. It takes time to treasure these things up in your heart. And so over time, you'll be able to do that too, where you'll be reading and be like, oh, that's just like that verse over here. And you can make those connections. Um, so what, what's God saying here? He, he, he put some effort into the planting of his people. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich fertile hill. Verse 2, he plowed the land, cleared its stones. He prepared the ground. Jesus said, uh, a sower went out to sow and scattered seed. And there's these different kinds of soil. And some of them produce nothing. Some of them produce a great harvest. Why? Because those that type of soil was was prepared and God's saying I prepared the ground for my my vineyard for so that my people would have every chance they would have every advantage he cleared the stones he planted it with the best vines in the middle he put, built a watchtower that's vision he, and carved a wine press in the nearby rocks that's a, taking a person through a process of becoming spiritually mature then he waited for the harvest of for a harvest of sweet grapes but the grapes that grew were bitter now, you people of Jerusalem and Judah, you judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not already done? When I expected sweet grapes, why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? Why? Because he had, he had told the people what they needed to do in order to uh, do well, and they did the opposite. They served other gods. They did all these other things. Verse 5, Now let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will tear down its hedges and let it be destroyed. I will break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed, a place overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to drop no rain on it. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of Heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. And so God's talking about how uh, they, the people oppressed the other, their fellow man. So because the two, Jesus, someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is here, O Israel. The Lord is your God. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this, there is another like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. They failed in the second side. They failed in that second commandment. They were, they were treating people wrong. And, uh, you know, another person might say, well, how can this be talking about us because God said it's the nation of Israel that that, that is it's the nation of Israel that is the vineyard of the Lord of Heaven's armies. Well, over in New Testament it talks about how we've been grafted in. Christians have been grafted in to uh, God's cultivated tree. You you who were once uh, wild branches of an olive a uh, wild olive tree, you've been grafted into God's cultivated tree, and so uh, that's what he's what he's what he's talking about. That's why we are included in this. Uh, in, uh, like I said, in Psalm 80, I think it's Psalm 80, you can go through there and you can see the vine and the branches and, and how the vine was transplanted, that's Jesus, but the branches that grow from that vine, they make it all the way to the sea, they make it all the way to the river, because the church has spread far and wide across the earth, where the branches, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And so... Anyway, he's talking about how now here, and this other side of it, and the old, the history, the historical side that the that the people, instead of doing what God said in His Word, began to oppress one another and treat each other without love. Verse eight: What sorrow awaits, or what sorrow for you? Excuse me. What sorrow for you who buy up house after house and field after field until everyone is evicted and you live alone in the land? But I have heard the Lord of Heaven's armies swear a solemn oath: Many houses will stand deserted. Even beautiful mansions will be empty. Ten acres of vineyard will not produce even six gallons of wine. Ten baskets of seed will yield only one basket of grain. Why? Because they were greedy. And he's going to cut off that 
the the what they were seeking after because they oppressed other people and they had and they've let other people have nothing and the few that are rich have taken everything so God's like well I'll just take away your increase. Verse eleven: What sorrow for those who get up early in the morning looking for a drink of alcohol and spend long evenings drinking wine to make themselves flaming drunk. They furnish wine and lovely music at their grand parties, lyre and harp, tambourine and flute, but they never think about the Lord or notice what He is doing. So my people will go into exile far away because they do not know me. Those who are great and honored will starve, and the common people will die of thirst. The grave is licking its lips in anticipation, opening its mouth wide. The great and the lowly and all the drunken mob will be swallowed up. Humanity will be destroyed and people brought down. Even the arrogant will lower their eyes in humiliation. But the Lord of heaven's armies will be exalted by his justice. The holiness of God will be displayed by his righteousness. And so it's, it's, what's happened is, is that they would not accept God's goodness. And, and because they would not follow what he said to do and how he is said to live, they're not accepting his blessings because the blessings come upon those who do what he says. And so they've rejected God, and God's like, well, if they've rejected me, then at the end of this, the end of this line that they, that they have chosen is going to be their destruction. And so as a result, I will be exalted because of, because of his justice. He's going to be exalted. But God can also be exalted because of his mercy. Better to let God be merciful. God will, God will be good to you. If you let him be good to you, you just got to do what he says. Verse 17, In that day lambs will find good pastures, and fat and sheep and young goats will feed among the ruins. What sorrow for those who drag their sins behind them with ropes made of lies, who drag wickedness behind them like a cart. They even mock God and say, Hurry up and do something. We want to see what you can do. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out his plan, for we want to know what it is. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that, light, uh, that dark is light and light is dark that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes who, and think themselves so clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine and boast about all the alcohol they can hold. They take bribes to let the wicked go free and they punish the innocent. Therefore, just as fire licks up stubble and dry grass shrivels in the flame, so their roots will rot and their flowers wither, for they have rejected the law of the Lord of heaven's armies. They have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That is why the Lord's anger burns against his people and why he has raised his fist to crush them. And I have the second part of that, the next part of that uh, verse highlighted out. Uh, for me, it just seemed like it might be a sticking point in young years. So you might uh, see how you might want to present that yourself later on. But even then, the Lord's anger is not satisfied. His fist is still poised to strike. He will send a signal to distant nations far away and whistle to those at the ends of the earth. They will come racing toward Jerusalem. See, this is where he is, at this time when Isaiah is making this prophecy, the people are still living in the land. But he's prophesying and saying, this is the judgment that God's going to bring. There's going to be a, a nation that comes and carries you away, and the land's going to be empty. Verse 27, they will not get tired or stumble. They will not stop for rest or sleep. Not a belt will be loose, not a sandal strap broken. Their arrows will be sharp and their bows ready for battle. Sparks will fly from their horses' hooves, and the wheels of their chariots will spin like a whirlwind. They will roar like lions, like the strongest of lions. Growling, they will pounce on their victims and carry them off, and no one will be there to rescue them. They will roar over their victims on that day of destruction, like the roaring of the sea. If someone looks across the land, only darkness and distress will be seen. Even the light will be darkened by clouds. And this is, yeah, a day of judgment, because the people wouldn't listen. And like I said, God gave them decades and decades to get right, and they wouldn't do it. Chapter 6. This is one of the uh, more famous chapters of Isaiah. But when you take the, all these chapters around together, then you understand why Isaiah's, why what's happening is happening. God's got, God is, because Isaiah is about to go through such a difficult time to watch what's going to happen to his people, God is going to allow him uh, to have a vision of God on the, on the throne because that is what's going to help Isaiah to get through this difficult time. Isaiah doesn't want to see his people go through this. Chapter 6, it was in the year King Uzziah died, and King Uzziah was one of the good kings, by the way, that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. 
With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. There's smoke again, smoke and fire, vapor of cloud. The Bible talks about that. A lot of people think that that's talking about judgment in the New Testament. Uh, but it's actually talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit in the believers. And so the, the seraphim are saying, you know, they, in the temple you can see God's glory. His robe, the train of his robe fills the entire temple. That's a symbol of God's glory. It fills the entire temple. And the whole place is, is filled with smoke, uh, the glory cloud. But then also... Uh, they say the whole earth is filled with his glory. But people look around and they don't see God's glory because his glory is not visible to the natural eye. And so uh, they're saying this statement, the whole earth is filled with God's glory. And they're praising God doing it. It's what they're doing. Verse 5, Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I, have, I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king the Lord of heaven's armies. And so Isaiah realizes, you know, he, he's been proclaiming the word of the Lord, but he realizes, I, I can't, he sees, he sees the results of the praise of God going forth in the temple, and he, and he sees the places filled with smoke, and he sees this awesome display of God's majesty and God's glory, and, he's, and he realizes now that, that this is what praise does. This is what, because when people begin to praise God, God then begins to display his glory. And so Isaiah realizes now the effect of praise and praise is made with the lips. And he says, I, 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 have, I have unclean lips. I am not, I, I, I am, I'm undone. I'm, wor I'm unworthy. And so he realizes a problem here. Verse six, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. And some people get caught up on that. Wow, you know, uh, maybe that's how it has to happen for me. No, 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 no. This is a symbol. It's a coal that's been taken from the fire that's underneath the altar in heaven. The altar in heaven is a representation of the altar that was on earth that represents the sacrifice that Jesus is going to make. And so it's a coal that's taken from the altar. John the Baptist said, Jesus will baptize you with spirit and with fire. This is just a, this is an ex, a symbol of something that Jesus has already paid for. This is why Isaiah is allowed this, uh, this mercy here. Verse 8. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? See, because God is wanting to address the issue. God didn't bring Isaiah sit there so that Isaiah could get all upset and realize, oh no, I'm 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 undone. That's not why God brought that's not why God brought Isaiah there. God brought Isaiah because God has a message that he needs delivered to the people. And so when Isaiah brings up this I, I'm not I'm not worthy thing, God just takes care of it and then says, okay now let's get to the matter at hand. Because God, and that's the way God, it always is. Whenever we realize we've messed up, we've gotten in over into sin. God's not interested in the fact that we are, are, are going, oh no, I'm completely unworthy. No, he wants to take care of that sin right away so that he can get back to the matter at hand, which is saving people. So he wants us to come to him immediately when we realize we've messed up and ask for forgiveness That's, uh, so that he can move on to the, to, the, to the thing that he wants to do. So verse 8, Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. This is Isaiah speaking. He said, here I am. Verse 9, and he, God, said, yes, go. And say to this people, listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people. Plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts, and turn to me for healing. So here's a translation note. Most translations render it like this. Um, but really it should say, listen carefully, but keep on not understanding. Watch closely, but keep on learning nothing. Because there's a, a, a note, that, because it looks like God's contradicting himself. It's like, why would he want, he's saying he wants to heal them, so why would he keep them from being healed? Well, you have to understand, there's a note in the Hebrew, uh, in the, 
uh, what, uh, in Dr. Young's, if you were to look at Dr. Young's concordance, he talks about how there is a permissive verb and a causative verb in the Hebrew. And this may be a little complicated, a little bit deep, but the only reason I'm mentioning it is, is because it's important for us to understand that a lot of times in the Old Testament, when it looks like God's causing problems, it doesn't actually mean that he's causing problems. It means that he's allowing things to happen. So he, what he's saying is it's, like, it's not like I'm going to keep you from understanding. It's like I'm going to keep speaking to you, but it's your choice to keep not understanding is, is what is really what, this, uh, what God is saying here. Verse 11, then I said, Lord, how long will this go on? Uh, and you know he's saying how, how long will they not listen how long will they not understand but also how long must I proclaim this message and he replied until their towns are empty their house their houses are deserted and the whole country is a wasteland until the Lord has sent everyone away and the entire land of Israel lies deserted if even a tenth a remnant survive it will be invaded again and burned but as a terebinth or oak tree leaves a stump when it is cut down so Israel's stump will be a holy seed and so what's God saying? There's hope. He's like, the, the people will be carried off, but there's hope. Because God doesn't want to completely abandon people. He, he, he want, he's in the business of getting people saved. He wants to save people. And so that's the whole point, right? That's the whole point. That's why, that's why when, we, when you accepted Christ as your Lord, when you said out loud Jesus was your Lord and, and believed in your heart, God raised him from the dead, it, it, that's why you weren't taken up immediately it's because we still have a job to do on this earth which is to get as many people saved as we can and before the day of judgment arrives and so in many ways this uh, our call is the same as isaiah's call which is to proclaim god's message which is jesus loves you uh, jesus saves and to tell people what jesus did for you because your personal testimony is the most powerful witnessing tool in your tool belt all right let's pray father thank you so much for all these people that join us uh, faithfully for Vologatos, Lord God. I pray that uh, you cause the message to go out wherever you desire it to go out, to the ears that you need it, that you want to hear it, Father God. I believe that as we continue to sow your word out and scatter your word out, that it will bear this, the fruit that you desire it to have, Father. And so I thank you, and in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. So bless you guys, and we will see you again.